Okay, so um, uh, welcome to the colloquium uh, series uh, um, uh, for the 9th of September, and it, it's a pleasure to welcome all of you uh, from TIFR um, with regards to the special colloquium uh, that uh, uh, Professor Shorindu Gupta, uh, a faculty of our institute, is going to give, especially on the COVID pandemic. So before I actually launch into um, this colloquium, I would like to first uh, share a bit of a uh, somber news. Um, uh, a very pioneering figure, um, part of the TIFR fabric and community, um, just passed away two days back. Um, this is Professor Govind Swaroop, one of the pioneering radio astronomers in the world and made outstanding contributions in actually setting up big, big telescopes, big projects in India. Um, the One of the famous projects, of course, the two famous projects are listed here, the Uti Radio Telescope, which he built in 1970, was part of the construction, and also the GMRT, the Giant Meter Wave Radio Telescope, which is near Pune. Um, uh, one of the big uh, contributions of uh, Professor Govind Swaroop is, apart from these big infrastructures that he constructed, um, the... Uh, the, the training that he provided to many of the students, both as scientists and engineers, is unparalleled. So we uh, miss him today very much and would like to dedicate this colloquium uh, by Professor Shorindu Gupta to in his memory. So um, one of the in interesting facets of the GMRT is GMRT was the first radio telescope to actually uh, get light from a most distant galaxy, almost 12, 12 billion years away from this planet. Um, and that really tells how, how important and significant a contribution he has left as his legacy. With that, I would like to um, involve uh, uh, Professor Sat uh, Dr. Satya Narayana, who manages the asset colloquium. So this is part of the NSF asset joint colloquium. Uh, Satya, please uh, advertise some of the asset colloquium. Uh, can you can you unshare unshare your screen? Jedi, can you remove your screen? Huh. Yeah, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, okay, just joining uh, JD uh, about, uh, he nicely talked about uh, Professor Goen's group. So on part of Asset Colloquium 2, uh, salute an outstanding experimentalist and also the builder of uh, many big facilities and institutions. Uh, as he rightly said, he leaves behind a very rich legacy as well as a large void and lots of, lots of inspiring memories. As it uh, remembers uh, his uh, colloquium uh, way back in 2008 as part of Homi Baba Bud Centenary Commemoration Series, uh, where he talked about great discoveries in radio astronomy and uh, key questions today. Uh, so that is uh, it's really a great loss to this country and also all the experimentalists uh, that we are all on. And uh, just going ahead and uh, kind of advertising a couple of talks that are coming up. On Friday, we have uh, Professor Uni Krishnan going to speak on enduring the course from Einstein's uh, the famous academic visit to Paris in 1922. I understand he's also giving a Wednesday colloquium on another topic uh, next week. Uh, I also would like to advertise uh, Engineers Day special asset colloquium uh, by Professor Subhashish Chaudhary, Director IIT Bombay, uh, asset colloquium on 15 September, which is the Engineers Day, which is of course commemorating the birthday of Moksha Mandal Sri. So, with these few words, now I transfer the control back to Jerry. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Satya. Um, so now it's a, my pleasure to actually have our own one of our own give the uh, joint NSF asset colloquium, Professor Shorindu Gupta, who is actually a leading exponent in quantum field theory, but because of the pandemic, um, has joined in the research efforts of understanding what COVID-19 really means to all of us. Okay, 
So over to Professor Sharan Gupta. Hi, thank you very much uh, for the introduction. I'm sorry this uh, got delayed. And uh, so I'll uh, start uh, immediately without further ado. Okay. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about is some doing how to do common sense, scientific common sense with the COVID-19 epidemic and with epidemics in general. Uh, as uh, Jyotishman just told you, uh, I'm not uh, an expert in epidemics at all. Okay. So like many others who are not experts but are doing epidemic science right now, what we bring to this is uh, our scientific common sense. Okay. Uh, so I've also learned a lot from discussions, corrections, and lessons which were given to me by my colleagues in DTP, in the rest of the IFR, and in a grouping of Indian scientists called Indian Scientists Re Response to COVID. It's been a very uh, wonderful journey working with them, talking to them, and so on. I would also like to thank my wife, Radhya Pacha Gupta, and her network of microbiologists and virologists across the world who have actually helped me a lot with what uh, you're going to see. Uh, um, I'll have to learn how to move this. Yeah, OK, fine, great. So uh, I'll, I've divided my talk into roughly three sections, but let's start uh, with this thing. This is a, a plot I downloaded on Friday. It showed all the outbreaks in uh, India, and it looks very gloomy. Okay, but uh, the interesting thing is how fast this num these numbers get outdated. So the numbers are changing very fast. You don't know where it is going, how it is going. Okay, and how do you make sense out of this? Most people would just follow the news. Okay, and the news is full of uh, fairly simplistic. Uh, depictions of the numbers, okay? So for example, on 18th April, which is uh, two, more than two weeks, almost three weeks after the uh, lockdown, the national lockdown, there was a report that says that there's a slowdown in the uh, epidemic. So how do, we, how do we understand this three week delay in the slowdown, okay? Almost immediately, people started writing about fatality rates and infection rates, how they differ, okay, what the ratio is, where, whether one can fall and the other rise, and so on. Also, kind of uh, taking all the data at face value without an attempt at the kind of analysis that most scientists would do. You don't expect the people who are writing these news stories to do this analysis because they're not scientists after all. But still, for us scientists, it becomes interesting to think about what's going on behind the headlines. Okay, so I'll uh, go on. Okay, so I'll step back a bit and I will tell you about the pitfalls of looking at science entirely from data. Okay, and that's because natural science, as we do it, is not data science. It's not really data driven uh, understanding of natural phenomena. Okay, what we do is quite different. Okay, we study objects, we study phenomena, and we ask ourselves, if I have seen this uh, phenomenon, then how do I understand it? What do you have to ask? What are the questions you ask in order to understand what you see? Okay, and then we ask, in order to have answered this question that we just asked, what is it that we want to measure? Now, for all of you who are in the TIFR family, you know that when we are in a seminar, listening to a seminar or asking questions, it's not really ever about the numbers per se. It is about how to get to the numbers, okay? Most of our attention is focused on the process of getting to the numbers, okay? Uh, so as a theorist, I ask about it in one way, but experimentalists might uh, want to understand the errors in the measurement, okay? They might want to understand the measuring instrument first, Okay, how carefully can you measure something? How precisely can you measure something? Is it worth measuring something? These are the questions that you ask. And the data that you obtain, the numbers that you get, is merely the last step in this. Okay. Now, of course, numerical methods, computing uh, professionals, they know this. 
So here's a quote from Richard Hamming, who was a famous uh, numerical analyst, computer scientist, worked with the Manhattan Project under Bethe. He said that the purpose of computing is insight, not numbers. And this is as true of natural sciences as it is of computing. The second thing that we have to be careful about when we think about epidemics is the difference between public health and science. Public health crisis managers are not scientists. Their goals are different. Their goals are to keep the public as healthy as possible. Okay. The data that they collect is biased towards this goal. They do not have, they do not study the same questions that we study. They look at what are the outbreaks, how to stop them, where they are spreading, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And they are the people who collect the data in a crisis like this. So since their goals are different, since their uh, methods are different, when we as scientists use their data, then we have to exercise great care about why the data was collected, whether it differs from what we want to know, okay, and how can we use that data. So there have been examples of bad science in the last few months. Okay, One example where bad science abounded was that attempted answer to uh, attempted question uh, attempts to answer the question when will the covid-19 crisis end and this is not been answered properly until now i have seen many predictions starting from april 8th a uh, third up till tomorrow okay and many of the people who are writing these models continually update them so the model predictions keep changing and as the months progress, their predictions keep changing by months. So it's completely unstable. Now, such a thing is clearly an example of bad science as we understand it. And it comes out of an incorrect understanding of input data and an insufficient attention to what the models can do with data, what the model inputs are, what the model outputs are. Okay, so we have to be very careful. But how do we start being careful? Okay, first thing we have to remember is that precision is not the same as accuracy. This is something that we all know, but in this crisis, it may not be so clear. So let me give an example. Supposing the number of detected infections is I. On a day T, it's I of T, okay? And towards the beginning of the epidemic, it grows exponentially, so it's doubling every capital T days, okay? This capital, this capital T is the doubling time, okay? So if the doubling time was 20, then in every 20 days, the number of infections doubles, okay? So you take this formula and you find that there's a, if you try to compute T, then there's a logarithm of the ratio of the number of infections on successive days that you have to take. Now, supposing one day you find that the doubling time is five days and the next day you find that it is eight days, okay? then this huge change in the doubling time over the course of two days is obviously breaking news, okay? But a scientist will be skeptical. First thing they'll ask is, if you look at the number of infections on two successive days, can you really distinguish between a growth period of five days and eight days? Okay, if you want to do that, what accuracy do you need? So it turns out that if the growth period was five days, 100 uh, infections on the first day would come to about 115 on the second day. If it was eight days, then 100 would go to 109. Okay, the difference is less than 5%. And the next thing you ask yourself, once you realize this, is does your measurement of I have this accuracy? Now that's a question that nobody will answer for you, but you can start speculating about the possible sources of uncertainty. Start listing them down. First of all, you realize that uh, diseases spread randomly, okay? You're passing someone on the street, that person may not cough, and you're fine. But that person is infected and he coughs just as you pass, and you might get a disease, okay? If you were two minutes later, it would not happen. So they're randomness, okay? So how much of this change from day to day do you expect simple randomness to be affecting the measurements? Next set of questions is about completeness of data. Okay, so you have a city of 20 million, like Bombay. Okay, 
perhaps uh, 10 to the 4 people are involved in disease surveillance, perhaps 1,000, perhaps 1 lakh, I don't know. But supposing you have such numbers of people looking for the disease, looking for diseased people, what are the chances that have, they have identified every case? You have to estimate this in some way. Okay. Similarly, you can ask, what is the fraction of asymptomatic cases? Can you really get every case that you want to observe? Okay. Otherwise, if you don't, then there is an unknown error here, which you must take into account. Then there's another set of uh, questions that you might ask. Okay, and that's about uh, actual measurement errors. So the swabs taken by health workers, do they always reach the RT-PCR labs without delay? Now, in no lab have we seen employee efficiency of 100%. That cannot be 100% during an epidemic either. Okay, so there are some swabs which reach the next day or the day after. What uh, effect does that have? We can also ask that if all RT-PCR labs are working with equal efficiency every day or not, because if they're not working with equal efficiency, then the numbers that they produce can be changing from day to day. And that goes into a notion of errors in the number, uncertainties in the number. Okay. So you can imagine that an employee takes leave or comes in half an hour late or half a day late, and uh, that would change the numbers. Okay. Associated with this, another question, as the number of cases increases, the number of samples to be tested also increases clearly. Is the testing process also scaling up as the number of uh, smoothly, as the number of cases increases? Or the, is it that there are more and more and more backlogs and then some people realize, no, no, we have to add some more testing facilities. Okay, So all of these will create fluctuations from day to day in the number of cases that are reported. How do you account for that? Okay, now BMC or MCGM published for some time the numbers and the self-correction. So here's a picture of uh, the number of official cases, how it changed day by day. Okay, so each uh, impulse, every line traces out the number of cases counted for that particular day. Okay, now, if I uh, take that, then you get that curve. But uh, BMC also gave us, for some time, what were the number of late detections? So swabs were taken, but they were not analyzed on the day that they were taken, but uh, the analysis came days later. So on roughly the 50th day, you can see that the number of backlog cases is about equal to the number of cases that they counted. Okay. And then it went on like that. Okay. So what do we make out of this? So if I want to find a percentage error, then I would do something like that. Multiply the number of cases found in that day by a percentage error. Let's say I say that there's 50% error. Then this is what that, that uh, continuous line that you get is what a 50% error would look like. And you find that some of the backlog cases are above that line, some are below that line. So 50% error is perhaps, if you look at it, slightly overestimating the error, day-to-day -day error. You could also plot a 20% error, and I've plotted that. That's the second line. And you can see that that's perhaps slightly underestimating uh, the, num the errors per day. Okay. So the actual errors per day is somewhere between 50% and 20%. And if I do a correct statistical analysis, I find that it's maybe about 25%. Okay, And that's the error due to delays. And we have no idea right now about the errors due to detection. I'll come to that later. Incomplete detection creates some errors. Okay, So let me just run with this for a while and see what I can do out of this. So here's the original curve that BMC gave you. On top of that, I have put data points, which is the top of that uh, bar, with a 25% error on it. Okay, And now let me make it look cleaner by removing the vertical bars. So this is the data, Okay, the official case count per day with a 25% error added because of delays in testing. Okay, This is part of the errors that we want to keep track of. So this is how it looks. It has been growing continuously. 
Okay. And now I can ask more detailed questions, use statistical analysis and so on. So this vertical line shows the day on which the national lockdown was imposed. But this is case data for Bombay. So you have to remember that Bombay went into lockdown a few days before the national lockdown. Okay. Uh, but let's take that as a ballpark marker. Okay. Now, as you can see, nothing special happened in the weeks after that. Yeah, the data keeps going up with roughly the same slope, occasional day-to-day -day ups and downs. And here there was a big three-day wonder, three days of, uh, of cases falling. And that was when some of those headlines were written. The case numbers have declined. Okay, it's not growing as fast. Okay, the cases are going down. Various people uh, at that point conjectured that by end of April, the epidemic will be over and will back to normal. Okay, but of course, the very next day, the cases went up again. Okay. Now, the first question that people should have asked is if the lockdown causes flattening, then why does it come into play 25 days after the lockdown? Okay. What is a natural time about after which the lockdown should have had an effect. So the first thing that you should keep track of is that there's something called a serial time when you have an infectious disease. So you catch someone who has an infectious disease, trace back who he got it from, trace back who that second person got it from, and so on, and ask how many days did it take on the average before the disease was passed on. That's called the serial time. Okay. For COVID-19, it turns out that serial time is between three and four days. So 25 days is a long, long time. Okay, six to eight generations of infections have happened in 25 days. So why did the lockdown ha not have an effect in the second generation, third generation after lockdown, but only after six to eight generations? So it's unnatural to think that it would happen so late. Okay, instead, what was happening? We see that there was definitely a slowdown. Okay, I have taken a slope uh, taken from the 50th day onwards and projected it backwards. And you can see that that slope is much smaller than, much lower than the slope of the early growth. Okay, that's the slope of the early growth. Okay, so they're distinctly two different slopes and we have to understand why this happened. So this is an interesting puzzle. And as a scientist, we should understand what was being measured, how it was being measured, and resolve this puzzle. Okay. So to do this, I compared six cities until mid-April, from the beginning to mid-April. And these six cities are listed here, Ahmedabad, Chennai, Delhi, Indore, Mumbai, Pune. These are the places where the COVID cases, uh, hotspots started early. Okay. In all cases, I found that uh, the cases are rising steadily. Okay. But the doubling time is also changing steadily. So the doubling time started with about one day. And then it kept increasing. The doubling time kept increasing. So the, it looked like the epidemic was continuously slowing down. Okay, Why was it adapting? Why was the doubling time adapting during that time? Okay, So that's a second order question that I ask. Okay. Another oddity that I found by looking at this is the following. In these early days, okay, the Pune epidemic was seeded from Mumbai in the following sense, that most cases where that happened in Pune were traced to contacts in Mumbai, or there are people who got infected in Mumbai and traveled to Pune. Okay. Although Mumbai was driving the cases, cases were rising faster in Pune than Mumbai. Okay. This is not what you expect. If uh, Mumbai were driving the cases in Pune, then the number of cases in Pune would rise as fast as Mumbai, or maybe slightly slower, but not faster. Okay, so I, for various such reasons, I thought it's very likely that there's a systematic error in the measurement. And knowing what was going on, reading the newspapers at that time, I attributed to the following thing, that there was no wide, large-scale disease surveillance network in Mumbai, Bombay, any of these cities. And during the early days of this epidemic, the local health authorities are building up this disease surveillance network. Okay. As they were building up this network, clearly they found 
more and more cases they found more and more backlog of cases okay so it looked like early on cases were increasing fast but as the disease surveillance network got more and more complete they could find fewer and fewer new outbreak hotspots within each city so randu there is a question yeah um what does the capital t1 stand for it's a small t in capital because you're adding two things which are t0 plus t times t1 t yes so what i mean is what i mean is that the doubling time seems to be steadily changing okay doubling time started with a t0 but as the days went on the doubling time kept increasing which means less and less new cases seem to be appearing relatively less new cases seem to be appearing okay, okay. this is because the disease surveillance network has been built up and it has started detecting all the cases that it had not detected earlier so that early fast growth apparent fast growth of the epidemic was actually a growth of the disease surveillance network so then your time part is uh, you have a double time product of two times is it the t times capital t1 yeah so this is modeling the fact that the slope is changing oh right Okay. I was just thinking of the dimension because there's a question by Upamanu. T one, T one is dimensionless. T zero has dimension of time. Okay. Ah, good question. We'll come to that. But you've given a uh, unit of days for T one, sorry, do. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, it's per uh, yeah. That's increasing by point one five every day. Yeah. Okay. No. So it's point one five to point two. Yeah. Sure. Please. Yes, because that uh, the delay due to the case developing, symptoms appearing is five days, five to six days. Okay, so that's. Yeah, but at that time the disease surveillance was faster. People were being caught at early stages. Okay, even if you take uh, longer, ten days, it's still a long time. Okay, uh, we can come back to this question later. Please ask me again, and we'll discuss this. Uh, uh, sorry, so, uh, if there are questions from uh, AG sixty six, can you also please repeat the question and then answer because we can't. Yeah, uh, sure, I'll do that. So the question was that. Uh, was that part of this thing part of this adaptive behavior that we saw adaptive the change of slope adaptation uh, that we saw was it due to the fact that diseases disease uh, manifests itself late so it has to build up to be detectable okay i get an infection i don't get disease symptoms right then okay and part of the answer is that uh, the time it takes to get the disease is not very large either to start showing symptoms is also not very large either okay and we can come back to this question later okay there were alternative explanations of course and they uh, fitted this change to you know change in a uh, number of uh, infections and so on and most of them were wrong by the end of the of may uh there are many other unknowns about the data and of course uh, one of them uh we have answered better since then a tifr study has done that they looked at sero prevalence of antibodies and asked how many people actually had enough exposure to the virus to create antibodies okay and that turns out to be an order of magnitude or two order of magnitudes larger than the number of cases that are reported okay so there is that mismatch between the number of detected cases and the number of infected cases one or two orders of magnitude okay i can put this in another way i look at something that uh, everyone knows about it's called the case fatality ratio cfr this is defined as the ratio of the number of deaths due to covid and the ratio of the and the number of detected cases so take the number of deaths divided by the number of detected cases and that's called the case fatality ratio that's roughly around 5 to 6% right now then there's another number that people worry about and that's called the infection fatality ratio 
and uh, that's the number of deaths divided by the actual number of infections okay the first the denominator was the number of detected cases here the denominator is the actual number of infections okay now the difference between them is actually in the denominator so in the first case we take the number that uh, bmc reports as the denominator and in this second case we could take the number that is uh, given by the tifr zero survey and then it comes to, out that the ifr is less than 0.1% but of course the numerator has remained the same but now you can ask the question that if the cases if the number of cases the denominator is underestimated by a factor of 50 then could the numerator not have been underestimated at all okay how accurately is the number of deaths known because you see that the ratio of the difference with the ratio of the cfr and ifr is something like again 50 60 70 <laughs> okay so that's a large factor also is that only due to not knowing the denominator or are we missing as many deaths as we are missing cases or less or more or none at all okay none at all seems to be unlikely but otherwise we have a question here which we need to answer in future okay then also you saw that there are small glitches in the data which are uh, like 3 4 days long okay i gave you an example that uh, one time when the cases fell a lot and the newspapers had uh, hysteria okay uh, is this due to new clusters of infections which are not detected so maybe the infection has spread from one place to another okay in some parts they are being controlled but in the meanwhile it has spread to another and disease surveillance has not come to the other case for three or four days okay or is it that there are clusters of infection in health workers so many health workers suddenly fall ill and and you know stop working so the number of uh, cases detected actually goes down artificially okay these are questions that are again something that's uh, important and we should try to understand this further in the coming days or months okay there are lots of uh, questions about the quality of the data about randomness and so on the errors in this so i'll not take this further i just want to raise these things as questions that every uh, natural scientist will ask how accurate is the data what are the errors have we identified every error are there unknown errors can we think about what are the possible sources of error there are can we try to plug the gaps when they, we know that there are errors okay that's one bit of common sense that science brings to this problem Sharandu, just uh, as you have paused in the thought, um, um, there is one more question from Ullas, who is asking, "Have you corrected for the testing rates?" So the testing rates are arbitrary. Yeah, that's a very good question. That's another good question. Okay, so testing rates affect the number of cases that you detect. Yes, very good. So there are there are lots of sources of errors, and we have to make it quantitative. If we if we go ahead ask the kind of questions that we ask as scientists which is not the same as the public health uh, management questions okay then we have to ask many of these questions okay okay thank you uh, sarendu can yeah please uh, can you also take another question from youtube uh, by ram prasad saptarishi uh, it says is it more reasonable to track fatalities as opposed to cases uh cases might also be affected by testing capacity being increased yeah can i come to that question later if you don't mind okay okay uh, there's another question okay. probably this can be answered now uh is there a reference for the serial time for covid-19 being 3 to 4 days yes there is a reference uh i don't have it with me right now but there is a reference i can put it on the slides at a later point and give the slides to jyotishman it will be available i guess on the tifr yes, yes sure no problem okay thank you for that question uh, jyotishman or uh, satya will you keep track of that question and remind me so that yes, is absolutely absolutely thank you i'll go ahead so the next uh, set of questions i want to ask are more <laughs> things more to my liking as a theorist okay this was kind of basic questions about the data which we need to understand 
and then there are things about the models that we need to understand okay and uh, so let me step back and say at the beginning in early march when this thing was becoming a problem i like many of you asked how should we maximize our own personal chances of survival what should we do okay and we came across these curves we came across the phrase flattening the curve we came across two curves you know one which rises fast and falls fast another which rises slowly falls slowly okay and the question in my mind as i'm sure it was in your minds also is what are these curves okay an epidemic is spreading the same epidemic is spreading okay when you draw these curves what is being changed and what is not being changed okay so i had to try to understand this in order to make sense of these curves okay and what i understood was that there's a whole theory of mathematical theory of epidemics which goes under the name of compartmental models of epidemics so the simplest model would be something like they are susceptible people who are susceptible to some infection okay they meet some infected people and the infection is passed on to them then these susceptible people go from being susceptible to being infected okay and then after some time the infected people are cured and they become susceptible again examples of such diseases are supposed to be common cold okay you get uh, you get a cold from somebody else okay and then you get infected and then you become uh, cured again but you can again get an, a cold okay so this is called the susceptible infected susceptible model okay and the consensus of opinion was that this is not how covid proceeds okay that was supposed to be the slightly more uh, complicated model where there's a, there are susceptible people who meet infected people and become infected so susceptible people move into the compartment called infected then the infected people either recover or uh, unfortunately die and they move into another box which we call recovered it's both all possible ends to the infection okay now you can see that the rates at which these happen is something that people like chemists have thought about a lot chemists know about the law of mass action they say that if two uh, two things are required two chemicals are required to for a reaction to proceed then the rate at which the uh, reaction will proceed will depend upon the product of the numbers of the two chemicals so the susceptible getting infected is like a two chemicals reacting susceptible people so the rate will depend upon the number of susceptible people and it will depend upon the number of infected people and we have to take a product okay so you can write down the following equations the number of susceptible people changes with time it decreases so it decreases proportional to the number of susceptible people and also proportional to the number of infected people with a proportionality constant which is the rate of this uh, of this infection which we call alpha that's the first equation out there so the rate of change of the number of susceptible is alpha times s times i where s is the number of susceptible i is the number of infected okay this rate is alpha this uh, number of susceptible is always decreasing the number of infected increases because a susceptible can become infected so there's one term on the derivative on the time on the rate which is the negative of this term when this decreases this must increase at the same rate and then also the number of infected get cured at a certain rate beta okay so that's this term and the number of susceptible plus the number of infected plus the number of recovered is fixed and that's the total population okay so you understand these equations now okay alpha is the rate of infections 1 by beta is called the mean time of recovery or resolution okay and uh, 1 by beta for covid turns out to be approximately 2 weeks okay there's a spread there but uh, something like 2 weeks okay now let's do dimensional analysis dimensional analysis asks what is the unit of time and i can choose the unit of time to be nanoseconds it makes no sense i can choose it to be days but what do days have to do with the virus okay so one choice that i could make 
is to choose the unit of time to be the mean recovery time. Okay, so one by beta. So that means that the equation will change slightly. That term which was beta in the second equation will just become one. Okay, and the rate alpha will also change because the unit of time has changed and alpha will go to alpha by beta. Okay, so the equations have become simpler because there's one constant instead of two. And that's just dimensional analysis. But there's one more thing that you notice about these equations, and that is they're supposed to be true, equally true for India and China and for smaller countries like Finland or Andorra or New Zealand. Okay, so the total number of people, the total population does not matter. In other words, there's a scaling symmetry. I can change the population by some factor lambda. And everything should remain the same if I change the number of susceptible, the number of infected, and the number of recovered also by the same factor. OK. So I could do that. And we can then choose lambda to be 1 by p. If I choose lambda to be 1 by p, then s, i, r all go from 0 to 1. OK, they're all positive numbers less than 1. And in this unit of uh, measuring the population, the rate constant alpha is usually called r0. So the equations become this. And this is the famous r0 that people talk about. OK, it's called the basic reproduction rate. And as I said before, 1 by beta is called the recovery time or resolution time. OK. Typically, okay, let me point out one more thing. I have already pointed out that the number of susceptible people always decreases, whereas the number of in infected people in the beginning where the number of where infections is small, minus i is uh, smaller, is can be neglected with respect to this term. So the number of infected people increases in late times where the number the susceptible uh, the number of susceptible people becomes small, then clearly this term dominates and the number of infected people decreases. OK, just keep that in mind as we go ahead. So number of susceptibles keeps decreasing, number of infections increases first and then decreases. And if you do a numerical solution, this is what you get. The red curve is for the number of infected people. The blue curve is for the number of susceptible people. And the green curve is for the rest. OK, one minus the sum of the other two curves. So this is a typical curve that you see. I want to point out two things. One, that there are stable and unstable equilibria for this system. Okay. If you go here, when the number of susceptibles is exactly one, and the number of infected, if it was exactly zero, then the uh, situation would remain as it is, exactly. There would be no change, but introduce you know, one part in billion of infected people and the epidemic will start growing. Okay, that's an unstable equilibrium. On this side, the number of susceptibles is very small. The number of infected goes away to zero. This is stable because if you introduce one more infected person here, the epidemic, it turns out, does not grow. Okay. So the next thing I will do is what the physicists call a phase space picture. Okay, so there are two quantities here, S and I, and I want to draw the locus of S and I, paths in the space of S and I, okay, which typify infections. Okay, I'll plot S on the X axis, I on the Y axis, and as the disease progresses, I will plot how these things change. Okay. Now you know how it will change in extremes, right? I already pointed that out. So they're stable and unstable points, okay? And whether it's stable or unstable, the rate of change of S and the rate of change of I is zero. If you want to set both of these rates to zero, then the number of infections is zero, okay? So these are stable and unstable fixed points. And of course, as I pointed out, there's a maximum of I, First, I increases, then it decreases, and it changes from increasing to decreasing when S becomes 1 by R0. 
So typical phase space plots look like this. S is on the x-axis, I is on the y-axis. First, S decreases slowly as I increases a lot. So you go from here up, okay, and then you reach a maximum and then you fall. Okay. So this is uh, how it goes. Every curve is of that kind. Okay. The nested curves, all increasing first and then decreasing. And the maximum is reached at a point which is where S is 1 by R0, which is what you see here at 1 by R0. All of these curves have their maximum. Okay. Now it turns out uh, something very interesting for a physicist. The epidemic equations can be derived from some Lagrangian. Okay, so there's clearly a classical mechanics. I can go to a Hamiltonian. I can look for what we call symplectic structure, KM, Tori, lots and lots of questions, which theorists are wonderfully, uh, find it a wonderful playground. Okay. So I will not ask these questions. If I ever talk about this again, it will be to theorists, but I just wanted to point out that there's a lot of interesting questions for theorists. How does this uh, relate to lockdown is what I'll ask. Okay, so here's a red curve. So you find initially that the number of infected is rising a little, okay. So you suspect that you're on some epidemic curve like this. What would a lockdown achieve? You know that if you don't do anything, you don't have a uh, medicine, you don't do anything, the number of infected people will rise to about that much before it starts falling. Eventually, the number of susceptible people will be so small, you can see that more than 95% of the population has gone from being susceptible to having been infected sometime in the past. And many of them will die. Many of them may have lingering problems. Okay, so you really want to do something about it. What do you do? You tell people to lock themselves down, not to meet each other. Because this is an infectious disease, if you don't meet another person, you're not going to pass that disease on. So you force through this method R0 to come down. So you the new phase space curves are these uh, black curves, these are with the new value of R0 that comes about because you have locked down. Okay. So now, if you lock down at a time when the infection reached this point, okay, then you went along the red curve until here, and after that, you moved along this black curve. Okay. Or if you lock down a little later, you would go up, and after that, you would go down again. Okay. Now, that's what you want to do with the lockdown. Okay. And if you had come to this uh, uh, this curve, then you would have uh, waited until the end, or you would have unlocked late in this uh, thing, late in this process of evolving along this black curve, so that you would come back to the original R0, but the number of uh, infections would keep decreasing. Okay, Or you could be here, and you just let it run till the end. Okay. This is the only solution that uh, seemed to be available at that time, because that was the framework. The SIR equations gave the framework for the lockdown. Okay, And uh, maybe that's not uh, correct. We don't know. But when you have only one tool, then everything looks like you have to solve it with that tool. When you have a hammer, you have to hammer at everything. Okay. The problem with this is, what happens if you don't know when to stop the lockdown? and you unlock too early. So you move from here to here, and then you unlock, and then cases still went down. OK, this could happen. Maybe that is what is happening today if this model was correct. But maybe this model is not correct, and so on. OK, so we'll ask such questions. OK, so anyway, this was the logic of the lockdown. Is there something more? There probably is something more, because here's an example of what is happening in Bombay for the last few months. There's a long, long plateau. Okay, there's a three month long plateau. The serial time of this disease is between three to four days, as I said earlier. The recovery time is somewhere between 10 and 20 days. So it's nowhere near several months. Okay, there's a big mismatch of scales between what the, the scales of time that the disease has and the scale of time of this plateau. So there must be some dynamics at work. But there's no plateau that you get in compartmental models. I al already showed you the phase space pictures of compartmental models. Okay, You won't get this plateau from such a simple compartmental model. Okay, Here is, again, something that a chemist 
will be able to solve the problem for you. They'll say, hold on. When you wrote down those rate equations, didn't you assume that the chemicals were well mixed, that you were stirring the vat all the time? If the chemicals had not been well mixed, would you have got exactly the same equations? Wouldn't chemicals have needed to diffuse together in order to react? And that's something interesting that does happen. Okay. And I believe this is what is happening now. Okay. You can see for yourself that many housing complexes gate up visitors like our own. Okay. There are meetings between people who live in different housing complexes becomes very restricted. Okay. So everybody is not constantly meeting everybody else. So the equations that I had written down earlier are not the complete story. Okay. There is incomplete mixing and we must write, we must do this. We must take care of this. The only difference that we have from physical sciences is that unlike physical sciences where molecules can only dip, move to locations near where they were in a short time. Okay. In, uh, for the case of human mobility, they're non-local interactions. People can fly from one city to another in an hour, or I can sit down in a car and in Kolaba and drive all the way to Pawai. And if I was infected, I could perhaps infect somebody in Pawai. Okay, so they are, they are non-local interactions. So instead of having distances, geographical distances, building that into the equations, I should think of equations where mixing is happening on a network. And each node in this network would be something like a housing complex. Okay, so from one housing complex, infected people go to other housing complexes and spread the infection and so on. Okay, it could be random networks of some kind or more complex networks. Okay, but the result is that what you get are like reaction diffusion equations, but they're the corresponding equations on a network. Okay, and that turns out to have very interesting properties, okay. The fixed points as before, that's I equal to zero again, okay. But they are very stable, long, uh, there's long-term stable solutions which have plateaus which arise generically for any parameters, okay. You don't have to fine tune anything. So, Randu, just, yes? just a quick clarification. Um, uh, since you have mentioned this linear model, like a kinetic scheme that chemists use, for example, in most of the cases, you have a sense of uh, the numbers of um, how the number is changing with time. Um, uh, for the infected cases, in this case, you have, you have blind spots, right? You have blind spots, which you don't know, uh, some asymptotic cases, which you are not detecting directly. Yes. So how does one think about that? So you, when you actually try to fit the data, you'll have to take care of that. Okay. I haven't uh, shown you what to do, okay. but I'm sure, okay. Why is it applicable to this problem that I showed you? Is that perhaps I should rephrase your question like that. And the reason that uh, I think the plateau in the number of detected cases implies the, that there's a plateau in the number of actual cases because the disease surveillance network is fairly well set now. If there were new outbreaks, sudden huge number of increase in cases, the disease surveillance network would catch that uptick. Okay, you can see, for example, in this curve, the blue curve is going up at the end. After Ganpati Visarjan, the curves have been going up. <laughs> okay, we are catching these new cases. So when there's an uptick, we do catch these new cases. Okay. Okay. So the fact that there is a plateau in the number of detected cases implies that there's a, a plateau in the total number of cases. Okay. Although I don't know what the total number of cases is, if I know that there are models which can uh, which can give such plateaus, then we have made some progress. Okay. Okay. And that's the argument that I'm making here. Okay, and if I try to fit uh, numbers, then I can do it with a small number of parameters. Okay, as I said before, I'm not going to talk much about much more about the theory now. If I ever talk about it, it will be to other theorists. But of course, others who are interested are always welcome. In if I give such a talk. Okay, and uh, this uh, idea of having uh, having. Uh, you know, reaction diffusion equations on networks and uh, describing 
uh, epidemics by them, it's, it's uh, not mine. It's been around for quite a long time. Okay. And uh, there are many, many papers. I just realized that this gives a plot. So there are some questions from Sorry. YouTube. Yeah. So, Sarindu, can uh, can we ask a couple of questions from YouTube? Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, this is Arvind Singh. Uh, what about the reinfection uh, in the last SIR plot, mainly at the end of the plot, uh, the epidemic can restart? Yes. Uh, so, of course, those are possibilities. Okay. But as we have seen recently, the earliest... Uh, we have like something like 20, 25 million people at, uh, affected across the world. Okay, the first confirmed cases of reinfections have happened after four and a half months. Okay, so the rate at which reinfections happen, if they happen at all, is much longer than the 10 to 15 days that we are thinking about or even the length of this plateau. So certainly at another time scale, you must take care of reinfections if they happen, if we find that they happen with, uh, with high frequency. But then, of course, there are other things missing also. Births and deaths are missing. Those also we must take care of at longer time scales. Okay. So what I've been talking about right now is things which developed over the last six months. Okay. And in that time scale, uh, the SIR model that I used was not the full story. They are certainly more complicated models, but they don't miss major effects on a time scale of a few months. Okay, when we go beyond, then of course other effects have to be taken into account. Another question, if I can just quickly ask you, uh, this is from Sanjeev Kumar Jha. Error in the detection of number of infection also varies with time. So how can we account for this change? Yeah, that is a measurement uh, problem. We, uh, how can we account? It's a good question. Okay. And it's open. Maybe Sanjeev, you can also answer this question if you put your mind to it. Okay. Clearly, some modeling will have to be done about how the testing is done, how, uh, how the detection is done and so on. But some more detailed models of the process of testing and isolation of cases will be necessary if we want to start correcting. They will introduce new parameters and then we'll have to start thinking about how to measure those parameters which are introduced. Okay, just the last one. Uh, what decides how long the plateau runs? Uh, what might be the reasons that India has a longer plateau time than other countries? This is from Som Datta Karar. Actually, there are two questions here. Okay, what first question is what determines how long the plateau runs within the model? The plateau runs for so long, uh, generically, again, that the model itself becomes invalid beyond that. Okay, So in other words, you could say that within the model, there's no end to the plateau. Okay, If you want to genuinely see where the plateau ends, you have to take into account these other effects that we talked about, reinfections, births, deaths, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Uh, that's the answer, quick answer to your first part of your question. The second part is, is there something special about the thing in India? Why is it running longer? And the answer, I think, is that the question is, should be rethought. India is not very special in this respect. If you take the country overall, it's rising. If you take Bombay, it has a three-month-long plateau. There are places where there have been plateaus which are about that long. Okay, uh, 9,200 days, let's say 7,200 days. Okay. Okay, so let me get on to the last part of my talk. And that's some of the numbers associated with COVID-19, which you can get from the kind of data that I have been showing and talking about. Okay. Uh, so first, for the first question that you might want to ask is, what is the age distribution of infected people? Okay, and uh, what would you expect a priori? You would say that there are more uh, young people in the country, so there should be more young people infected. There are very few people who live to 80, 90, 100, 
So the number of infected people who are of that age, 80 and above, should be small. And this is by and large true. But you also know that the that children get infected at a smaller rate. Okay. So just looking at the population distribution does not give you the full answer, and you have to measure. Okay, so here I've put the population distribution. That's this uh, bar chart. Okay. And that's taken from the 2011 census. I could correct it a little using various demographic models to bring it to 2020. It will not change it so much. Okay. The number of infections I can estimate, I, the age distribution, not the number of, uh, not the total number, but the age distribution, I can sample. Any sample that I take, if it is sufficiently representative, will give me what is the histogram of the age distribution. Okay, so I take histo I take sampling samples of that kind, and I find that this is what the age distribution looks like. There's a very, it's very different from the population distribution. In particular, there are a lot more infections in this age group. Okay, 20 to 40, maybe 20 to 50 than you might expect from the population distribution. And of course, they're less for uh, children less than 10 and for teenagers, okay? This part is perhaps expected, but this part is an empirical finding, okay? Why does this happen? For that, we have to study it a bit more. Maybe these people go out of their house more often. Than maybe they meet more people, so there's a different exposure rate. Okay, maybe there's a different infection rate. Okay, we don't know. And maybe there are different testing rates. Maybe older people get tested less. Maybe younger people get tested less. Okay, so there are all these possibilities and there must be more detailed studies in order to understand this curve. But as it stands, the infections that, these, that you get in this age group is much larger than the population distribution would lead you to expect. And this is significant, as I'll tell you, soon. Okay, what about the sex distribution? What about the age and sex joint distribution? Okay, now surprisingly, I found that in India, the women seem to be less infected, okay? Uh, about two thirds of the infections seem to belong to men and only about one third seem to belong to women. So the sex ratio female to male among the infected is about half overall. And even within this half, there's a strong age structure. Okay, there, the number of children who are infected does not seem to really depend upon the uh, sex. Okay, so here the histogram is the mean num ratio female to male of the people infected in a certain age group, okay? And the red things are the error bars on this estimate, okay? So in the age zero to 10 group, it could be about one. It's not significantly different from one, okay? But in other age groups, there's definitely a difference. And the minimum in the sex ratio comes at, something like 40, 50, okay? So if I regroup this so that I look at the male-female ratio for ages below menopause, uh, below puberty and above puberty and in between, I find that there's a strong age dependence to this, okay? During the reproductive age, the number of women who are being diagnosed as uh, COVID positive is much smaller. So, I am very puzzled by this. I cannot figure out more. I looked at it in many different ways. Okay, some people say that this is due to some special Indian genetics because it's not seen anywhere else in the world. But other people suggest that it's differential access to healthcare. Okay, there are of course other ways of uh, looking at this. If it's genetics, then Indian populations living in other countries should also show similar uh, age structure. Uh, such data is not yet available, okay? But if it is not that and it's differential access to healthcare, then that's really something that we should worry about in the future, okay? Because uh, this is very, very significant. Okay. What about fatalities due to COVID-19? 
Okay. Now, again, I look at the age distribution. We don't know how many people have died. We don't know how many people have been infected, but we know the age distribution from any sample that we take. We take a sample of infected people and ask how many have died and what age they are. And that should give us the age distribution. Okay, so the total detected number does not matter because you're just sampling. Okay. And uh, so there are predictions. Okay, there are some, there, there was an earlier uh, paper, uh, I think Lancet Infectious Diseases, where uh, this number, this age distribution had been uh, inferred from uh, data on East Asian populations, largely East Asian populations. That was because that uh, this was an early paper and that's where the infections were at that time. And that's the thing that is shown in the histogram here. Okay, that's what happens in East, East Asia, the age distribution. What happens in India uh, is, and, and sorry, I, I'll say another thing before I go on. Okay, that's the age distribution, the histogram. And these faint gray bars that you see above and below are the errors in each of these histograms. Okay, each of these uh, bars. And what happens in India is shown in red. Okay, and there could be a little skew towards younger ages, perhaps, but you know the error bars are so large that the skew is not significant. So the age distribution of deaths in India is. Uh, statistically indistinguishable from the age distribution of deaths in East Asia. Okay. Now, of course, the East Asian study also uh, gave us an IFR. Okay, and that IFR was 0.4 percent. You could, of course, argue that although the age distribution is the same, India is special because the overall IFR is larger or smaller. But that's not the uh, that's not the minimal hypothesis that you can make. The minimal hypothesis is that if the age distribution is the same, then the IFR is the same, and if that is so, then there must be unidentified deaths. But this is certainly something that we should study more going ahead. Okay. Now, deaths are only one of the many many outcomes that an infection by COVID could have, okay? And that's the one that we see fastest because it's the thing that happens on very short time scales, a few weeks, okay? Complete recovery is another thing that we can see and that, uh, but there's a whole spectrum between them, okay? And I'll just list some of these things that can happen, okay? There can be long-term damage to lungs, okay? And that is certainly known in severe cases, but also there has been similar studies which see that there is similar lung damage also for people who have had only mild infections. Okay, and there's several publications which look at this. There's cardiac damage, okay, and there's been at least one paper which I saw in JAMA, uh, and uh, that comes from Germany, which sees that. Uh, Severe and mild cases have lasting cardiac effects, lasting in the sense that the study, I think, looked at some few weeks after the infection is over. Okay. And not a very large number of people, but still, it's not an inconsiderable number of people who were seen in this study, who were studied in this. Study. There are neurological effects, there are strokes, there's inability to concentrate, persistent extreme tiredness over many months. Huh after either severe, mild, or asymptotic cases. All these uh, symptoms have been reported in the long term. I'm, I've seen reports, I've seen case studies, I've not seen any systematic statistical analysis of this, okay? And of course, there are also case studies of damage to other organ systems and so on. So, you know, the, the medium term, I'll call this medium term, we don't really know whether these are long term because the COVID infection has not been around for very long. Okay, there are, there's damage that persists be, even after you recover. So even if you have a mild case or you're not symptomatic, if you're 20, if you're 30, you should not bring, you should not uh, take risks. Because supposing you have 
a cardiac effect which is long lasting you live the rest of your life with it okay so that's a moral that it's not only old people who are affected here young people should also take care safeguard themselves and the safeguards are simple we all know the simple safeguards okay just follow them we just don't know enough about this disease to be sure that a recovery is a complete recovery okay so many of us have this feeling that we get from newspapers that a vaccine will solve everything and that reminds me of this old cartoon by sydney harris which has some long calculation and one step is then a miracle occurs okay and the miracle in our case would be a vaccine but uh, any scientist any experienced scientist will tell you that you just hold on you know it's not a miracle just relax think about it a little bit more analyze it more thoroughly and when we analyze it we find that the numbers are not really so good okay so one of the things that uh, i saw was a news item in nature this week uh last week rather okay which said that india and the gavi foundation uh, are uh, putting money into the oxford astrazeneca vaccine okay now today i see some news uh, not so enchanting news about uh, this vaccine but still it's in phase 3 trials okay uh, there's a company called the serum institute in india which has already stockpiled a million doses of this and it says that it can convert facilities which are now producing other vaccines to produce 60 million doses in one month 50% of this will be reserved for india okay and some of the uh, funding for some of the price of this part of the price of these uh, vaccines will be offset by funding from the gavi foundation okay so in india it uh, should cost only 225 rupees per dose okay we say 225 rupees it is small for us but for a public health ent enterprise if the government of india wants to procure that it's still a large amount of money okay now how does this pan out in terms of the epidemic so i look for the number of hospitals in india and it turns out that there are about 10 to the 4 hospitals in india okay so the number of vaccination centers is not going to be very much larger i assume that there are 3 into 10 to the 4 vaccination centers that we can create okay and there's a monthly supply of about uh, 30 million doses coming to these vaccination centers so each center gets 1000 doses in a month okay 1000 is not a large number okay so how do we vaccinate and already you can see reports that more susceptible people will be vaccinated first so many of us will have long waits okay that's one way to look at it another way to look at how long the wait is to ask how long the wait will be okay the population of india is 1.3 billion people and maybe 60% maybe 75% of them need to be vaccinated for herd immunity to set in and that's about a billion people okay the supply is 30 million doses a month okay so it will require 34 months for immunization okay and this simple arithmetic tells you that you should be prepared for a long wait however gagandeep kang recently pointed out that uh, the measles rubella vaccine was to be delivered to 405 million people and that took 3 years so if that kind of a network has to be set up for this vaccine maybe it will take longer than this 3 years okay whatever the numbers are a few years okay then of course i have not uh, asked the question how effective is the vaccine how many doses do you need okay if you get the vaccine once do you get lifelong immunity or do you need to take it every year okay these are questions that you'll still have to ask okay so there's not going to be a miracle there's going to be a wait and maybe there's no miracle okay maybe vaccine is one way of course to go but maybe it does not replace treatment okay and because we cannot give a vaccine for a few years five years three years whatever there will be a burden of morbidity which will take a generation of people who have been uh, infected and you know there will be health problems for them so the understanding of the biology of the disease and the virus will remain important okay there's no miracle here the only thing that we can do 
And I want to end my talk with this, that funding for science will remain important and it is as important today as it will be in the future. Okay, the biology of the virus, okay, the biology of the disease, morbidities will have to be studied. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Shorendu. This was very nice, fantastic. Uh, uh, and lots of, lots of questions already. The entire chat box is buzzing. Uh, so there are lots of questions. I, I will ask my um, co-host, uh, Dr. Satyanarana, to take a few questions from YouTube. And then we'll come back to some of the chat box questions. Okay. Uh, let me take a few. Uh, Ram Prasad uh, Satarshi, uh, was that India? distribution he was referring to your plot where you had shown the uh, age distribution plot uh, according to the census mumbai's age distribution appears to be largely bimodal uh, with the 20 to 30 bracket being the largest nearly 20 percent of mass uh, can you uh, can you move to uh, okay you uh, can you can you move to that uh, plot uh, sarinder uh, can you tell me again which plot you want? I think the uh, the participant is referring to your age distribution plot, which is I think about seven, seven or eight uh, slides uh, from the end. Maybe maybe ten. Is this the one? Can you no. see the shared screen? We uh, can't see. No, we can't see. Uh, it is showing uh, you actually. Uh, yeah. Can you share it again? Now you can see? No, no, it's still the, it's just showing the first slide and that too. Please uh, put it on full screen mode, please. Full screen and yeah, that's right. Full screen, full screen. I want full screen mode and I'll go there. Just put it on full screen mode and move over, please. Try control L. Rajesh, I control. One minute, one minute. Now, Can you see it? No, he cannot. No, no. Can you see anything at all? Yeah, we can see the, the presentation. So you can even probably go uh, in the presentation. Yeah, Which we, page do you see? As well as your opening up of an explorer window, some internet. Yeah, it is actually superimposed one on top of other. Okay, which uh, page of the presentation do you see? The first page. The first one. This is first page. Toto, you have this file. You can open. Uh, no, unfortunately, I don't have. Oh. Okay. Okay, I'll I'll just use. Uh, so something has happened here. Uh, one moment. Okay, I. Will go for the, not this one. Ah, now the the explorer thing vanished. So yeah, now can you move in the slides even in this? Ah, great. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll do it. Okay. And for some reason, it's not uh, going into full screen mode. But let me just go ahead. Uh, I think this is fine if you can move down. Is this the one that you were going to click here? I think, yeah. About, about it. Yeah. Is this what you were referring to in the question? I guess, I guess there is another one which is more. Uh, uh, this one? This yeah, one I think was, so. Because unfortunately, uh, I, this is a, this is a this YouTube. Uh, female, female things. Uh, I think more of the age one, the age 60 to 70. The, 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 yeah, 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 that one. Either this one ah, or that one. Maybe, maybe yeah. this one, yeah. The, the next one. Right, right. Yeah, uh, yeah this one. Yeah. Should so, I ask the question again? Yeah, please ask the question. Again. Okay. Was that India sage distribution? That is the question. Uh, according to the census, Mumbai sage distribution appears to be largely bimodal uh, with the 20 to 30 year bracket being the largest. So I think that is a kind of comment, nearly 20% of the mass. That's what it says. I don't see that, but uh, maybe they're referring to this. Yeah, that one. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let me 
it's not bimodal it's a single peak it's certainly not bimodal okay okay maybe there is a little confusion but let me ask a few more questions quickly uh, less infection in female compared to male is not specific to india uh, maybe that is a comment mm -hmm. Uh, okay, Arvind Singh. Uh, when n equal to uh, no, let me answer that. I'm sorry. Okay, I think I think it is specific to India. What is usually quoted is that women are less likely to die. Okay, that twice as many among deaths that twice as many men as women across the world. Okay, but in the number of infections, the number of women. and number of men is equal in almost every part of the world india is special in that in infections the number of females is half okay of course what is seen worldwide in deaths is also seen in india so it is possible that only the most severe cases are going are being detected among women so that uh, number of infected uh, women resulting in death is much higher okay one does not understand this this is definitely a difference between the sex ratio in india and rest of the world okay uh, maybe i'll skip one but i'll ask sankalpa benerji research published in china indicating that men were more likely to get a more severe case of the virus as compared to women uh, which seems to agree with the reports that more men are more vulnerable uh, well as i just explained no, i mean there is a further sorry vulnerable to infection so is this something uh, to be interpreted more from a biological perspective or a social uh, slash lifestyle based perspective i think i just explained it let me be clear again okay nowhere else in the world have we seen the number of infected cases to be smaller significantly smaller among women than in men the number of deaths had been has been seen to be significantly smaller in women so of course severe cases which result in deaths are smaller among women but the total number of infections women having less of them has not been seen anywhere else in the world to the best of my knowledge if somebody has alternative data they could share okay uh, uh, just one very quick question from kausalya any numbers or rate on reinfection so she is kind of asking if there is any information on the reinfection uh, i don't have an analysis of that the numbers are so small that it's not possible to do uh, statistics with them at this time uh, can i also request going to earlier question on why we are not tracking fatalities as opposed to cases and that is less likely to have biases due to testing strategies changing over time so this is the question that uh, was asked before by ram prasad okay so uh, let me put it this way in order for a death to be classified as a covid 19 death the swab that was taken before uh, death has to turn out to be positive okay so you cannot have a death classified as covid 19 where the swabs have not been tested before okay if there's been no testing then that case is not classified as covid 19 the moral of the story is that exactly the same process is being followed for testing whether somebody has got the disease and whether a death is due to the disease okay so maybe there are similar errors in both we don't really know okay there have been estimates that we are missing large number of deaths there are also claims that we are not missing large number of covid-19 deaths okay we will have to do independent sampling or independent estimates of some kind in order to see this answer this question more carefully we cannot on the basis of the data available to us now answer this definitely one way or the other all we can say is that there are questions why is the cfr so different from the ifr okay that's one question is the ifr really so low 
another question. Okay. So one can generate questions, but one cannot get an answer without looking, without getting new data. Okay. Okay. Uh, Jyotishman, probably you need to take some questions, yes. right? Yes. Uh, we still yes. have a few, but I think maybe we should take something from Zoom. Sure, sure. So uh, I would ask um, our audience to uh, actually come in the video and ask the question directly. There have been some discussion on the the women uh, statistics uh, that was very strange and you also pointed it out. Um, uh, so there have been some discussions in the chat, but I would like direct questioning from audience that will be preferable. So uh, Dr. Ramdas, who is uh, with us, uh, you can ask your question. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, Saurindu, can you give a quick summary in words of the why the plateau happens? Uh, that's a uh, that's a different question. Yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, it's uh, so I I can give you intuition in terms of standard reaction diffusion equations in chemistry. Okay, supposing a reaction is diffusion limited. Okay, then the reaction will keep going. Before the uh, reactants are used up, there will be a steady production of the. Uh, what does Sorry. diffusion limited mean? Means that the rate of diffusion is smaller or the, or the inverse rate is larger than the rate of reaction. Okay, okay. okay. So, so the, 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 the reactor, the reactor is most of the time waiting for the reactants to come in. Ah, very good, very good. Okay, okay. Uh, okay. So, but you had in your paper kind of there were words like hierarchical that I saw in the paper. Yeah. So I was wondering if you could. So you shouldn't call it paper because it's a it's a preliminary draft, and I've been thinking more about it, and I can rephrase it as a reaction diffusion equation, and ah. that gives me better uh, physical understanding, better intuition about how. This but this, you don't expect this plateau to be a permanent feature. I mean, does a plateau kind of preclude an de eventual decrease necessarily? Yeah, of course, when all the reactants are used up, when everybody has become infected. <laughs> yes, because it has okay, become. only, okay, okay. Huh, that, that's definitely, that's a proof that's, that it is. That's a proof that it is. Somebody, okay. reach a plateau, there is a little possibility of a further. <laughs> Well, um, maybe Ramdas, we could talk about this later. But the thing is, if you if you take intuition from reaction diffusion equations, you see that if the diffusion diffusion constant were larger, if people were moving about faster or more often, then the reaction rate would also start rising and so on. Okay. okay. So if you unlock down, then the reaction rate would go up. That's the kind of intuition, roughly speaking, that you get. But of course, the numbers are something that need to be calculated. Okay, thank you. Okay, there is a question by Sanjay, I think. Sanjay had a question. Sanjay, could you unmute yourself? Yeah, uh, Saurindu, are you able to hear me? Yes. Yeah, see this uh, kinetic scheme that you showed that S goes to I and then that goes to the uh, uh, cured people. Sure. See, if you start your simulation at t equal to zero, when i is present in some finite number, i plus s does not consume that i. So the scheme of things should include i plus beta s i. And not having included that, would that make the final You mean this equation? These equation? ds by dt is minus alpha times s i. Di by dt is alpha si because of the outcome different. Is this what you mean? Yes. So yeah. that should be. Plus we are losing alpha it. alpha I, si. We lost you, sir. Can, can you repeat? Can you repeat? Yeah. Uh, because the i doesn't. Ah, we are losing you, Sanjay. Okay, Sanjay, maybe we could talk about this later, but let me just uh, go through this once more. The susceptible people, people 
move into this right. category, provided they come in contact with somebody from somebody who's infected. Okay. <laughs> the rate of loss of susceptible people is given by this. The rate of loss of susceptible people is also the rate of gain of infected people. Okay, people move from here into here. The only way they can move out is by recovering, which happens with a rate which is independent of anything except the number of infected people. Okay, now, if that explains things, I'm fine. Otherwise, we could talk about it later. Uh, Sarindu? Yeah. Uh, can I ask one question? Uh, the username... The participant name is not very clear, but the question seems quite relevant. Are we able to predict how long the epidemic will last? Because you've shown some comments in the beginning about that. Maybe you can say a word or two on that. So going by the track record of models, I would say no. Because models are all over the place. Okay. I think there are many details about the spread of the infection, which are not being captured yet. Okay, they're completely different uh, uh, kinds of approaches called agent-based approaches. Okay, there are more detailed network approaches which have not been tried yet. Okay, so I would say perhaps in the future, as we understand these models slightly better, we are able to work on them with more confidence. We will be able to say a few things, okay? And when I say in future, I do not mean five years in the future. I mean a few weeks in the future. Maybe we'll be able to make more confident statements. <clears throat> okay, but prediction, as you know, is hard, especially when you are talking about the future. <laughs> okay. So um, uh, are there any questions from the audience, the internal audience? Okay, well, I think the the count has gone down, but um, if uh, I may just uh, read through some of these uh, uh, chats that you may not have a chance to look at, but people have been asking why the female numbers are low, at least. Um, uh, do you have some thought process into it? Some people are uh, talking about the Cero survey showed that the female, um, the female population had more antibodies. Um, um, and, and of course they are getting infected, but they're not showing symptoms or um, there are some, some hypotheses that uh, uh, medical attention is not seeked, seeked by females more as compared to men. So, this uh, is, uh, so th these are the two possible alternatives, okay. because if you look at the case numbers as uh, we see them, yeah. okay. The number of females is less, but if you look at the number of infections through sero survey, then the number of infections is the same as the number among females and males is similar. Right. Okay. The difference is either the fact that uh, uh, either due to the two conjectures, one is that they don't seek it, uh, medical attention or they are they get less medical attention, and the second is that maybe they don't develop equal number equal uh, or strong infections equally often. Okay. okay. The latter is certainly not true across the world. Okay. Because if you look at the number of infected in say Germany or South Korea or Vietnam, okay, the male female ratio in the number of infected is close to one. Okay. So if we are the same as the rest of the world, in our response to COVID, then we should also be one. Okay. Okay. And then there is one question by Anupam. Uh, he has two questions, actually. How does the intervention like wearing mask affect the data as this guideline came late from agencies? The second part of the question is, is the virus mutating to a less severe version? Does the data answer this? Actually, the data does not seem to show any of these things, but okay. as I okay. said earlier, there are errors which we still don't know. So. Okay. And then there is a comment by pa uh, S. Pathak, um, if she's around, I don't know if he's around, or, I'm sorry, he's around. So um, uh, we should 
call all all the deaths covid related deaths yes i'm yes. around and yeah oh. so what we have seen was like i think day before yesterday's newspaper said that about 30% more deaths reported in the la- in the pandemic year this year in the, the six months compared to 2019 unfortunately i hate this only 2019 it would have been better if they had reported a five year average for comparison but if these are 30% more deaths are they all due to covid 19 what i think is we should call them covid related because um anecdotally i know many doctors and many of them are saying in mumbai especially in the age group of 40 to 50 there are many more cardiac deaths being reported this time than whether they are due to covid or due to just hard uh, i mean you know financial constraints and therefore the stress i do not know so i think you know all these unreported deaths are all covid related perhaps not necessarily due to covid though just a comment Yeah, of course, all this is conjecture. We'll need yeah, to course. understand data better. Yeah. Okay. Oh, you you do you want to expand on the response, or that was a current? <laughs> that was a comment, so I don't have much yeah. to add. Yeah. Okay. 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 <laughs> so you sort of agree. Okay. So um. No, I made my statement. I said that. Uh, just numbers by themselves don't say much don't say study. much so you can't until you, can't you study come. the possible sources of error and ask more detailed questions okay okay so um i think there is one more question uh, satya i will just take one more question from this side um uh, somebody is asking why susceptibility rate decreasing in equation ds by dt equal to minus alpha si uh, any biological reason so well if a susceptible becomes infected then the number of susceptible decreases decreases just a great great yeah it's a obvious thing it's okay a... okay uh, sarindu so uh, you are going to have a little tough question uh, uh, your <laughs> your your opinion of prediction of the model by uh, professor sandeep juneja of tifr Uh, that herd immunity is setting in by december what is your opinion on that well i cannot have an opinion on that because uh, that requires the model study okay and uh, they have done a careful job of uh, of uh, including previous data fitting the many model parameters this this is not like one of these equations where there's one model parameter but there are many okay but they have done the best they can uh, getting those parameters from previous data from other kinds of data and that prediction is what they show uh, one would always expect that uh, they will do further studies and uh, tell us how stable or unstable these predictions are if you change input slightly how they change and so on we we'll look forward to those things but uh, it's a very good study and uh, i look forward to more details okay good so uh, satya is that uh, yeah. is that all we can conclude okay. here yes yes that's all okay fantastic so thank you sharendu uh, thank you for this wonderful uh, sort of discussion uh, through the work that you have done uh, and uh, i i also thank all the audience for their enthusiastic participation our numbers crossed 100 satya so which was great and the youtube channel was hitting around 100 or close to that so it was fantastic so uh, i just wanted to tell all of you that um, we continue our uh, wednesday colloquium series so does satya is uh, asset colloquium series um, uh, we we convene on wednesday next where professor unni krishnan is going to give a talk and uh, satya i think you can make your announcement uh, yeah this friday. friday we have uh, unni krishnan talking about this 1922 visit of uh, to paris uh, by einstein and also on uh, 15th uh, that is tuesday uh, next uh, we are also going to have uh, uh, professor subhashish chaudhary of uh, iit bombay uh, speaking on um, machine learning uh, the part of uh, engineers day special asset colloquy okay fantastic and before we sign off today me and satya the host for this particular session Uh, i would like you to go through uh, all of you to go back and see professor gorun govin swaroop's contribution tremendous contribution to science and engineering development in india 
uh, with that we sign off um, all the uh, all this video will be put up in the TIFR Platinum Jubilee events YouTube channel uh, which Dr. Satyanarayan maintains um, so thank you very much and have a great evening ahead thank you thank you Sarendu thank you very much thanks, thanks a lot